This episode is powered by denmeditation.com. The meditation is the primary focus. The bigger goal is for people to understand and love themselves, thus creating more harmony in the community at large. To find out more about Den Meditation's teacher training programs, retreats, and all things Den Meditation, go to denmeditation.com. back to Den Talks Podcast. Thank you so much for your patience during this break. We are here now for season three. We're very excited. we got some great guests coming up and always open to your feedback and who you want to hear and what kind of topics you'd like us to talk about. So get in touch with us and let us know. Um, but in the meantime, I also wanted to let you know we have some really great fall trainings happening at denmeditation.com. And you can use the code DENTALKS, capital D-E-N, TALKS, to get $50 off. We have Journey Around the Medicine Wheel, which is mine coming up. So please join me for that. You have, if you want to learn tarot, tarot 101. If you want to learn Akashic Records, we talk a lot about the Akashic Records here on this podcast. If you want to learn how to access them, that is a three-day training. Also breath work, so many different things. Go to the website, denmeditation.com. Check out certifications and programs. And again, you get $50 off with Dentox code. You know, I love these episodes with a good channel because they're just always so amazing and such a wealth of information. We have Anne Tucker. She channels from the angelic realm, and I'm pretty convinced she's just from the angelic realm herself. And you'll get that sense of her too when, when you hear the conversation. Um, we talk about everything, just A, how she found her own journey, and how she got in there. And I love that because it's actually very helpful, I think, for a lot of us, you know, just the bumps in the road we all go through, but how do you transmute those bumps in the road to actually see what it's trying to teach you? And then, of course, we get into just juicy conversations about where are we in humanity? Where are we? What does the earth need? What do we need? How are we, you know, we talk a lot about ascension, the fact that we are all being called to kind of raise our vibration right now. We're going up a level. Really good stuff. It's just about how the earth actually transmutes things. She did a whole journey into the earth. It's really fascinating. There's a lot of good conversation here that I think will get your brain spinning, but hopefully at the core of it, it will make you take a step every single morning and thinking, what can I do? What small little thing can I do? What is my part in playing that is going to be for the betterment of humanity? And what I think I love about this conversation the most is you leave knowing there's a small thing that you can do. How are you? I feel like you've been channeling up a storm. Are you exhausted? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, it's funny because I have been like just recently I was, uh, I had a retreat two weekend, like weekend before last and I have a retreat this weekend and those retreats are super intensive because I'm channeling like all day. The whole, yeah. So it's like, yeah. So at the moment, yes, <laughs> I'm like, I've been How very tuned in. I was going to say, how do you feel though after those? Are you fully depleted? Are you more wired? Are you more connected? Yeah. You know, it's funny. Like I do, cause the channeling does definitely take energy from me. Like it's, it's, it, it's healing and it's fills me up. But at the same time, if I, uh, like if I do too much, it, it does exhaust me. So I have to be careful of it. Like in the beginning, when I first started channeling the angels, it was, it was very, like I had to really watch what I was doing. And, uh, every time I've expanded, taken on more, it's, there would be a period one time where I actually signed up for, I, I, I started offering these two different programs and it was, I used to do like week on week off. And then I was doing every week for a while. And Oof. I was just, I would have to sleep in between. So oh. it was way too much. Yeah. So these days I'm really aware of it just cause it's, I mean, it's, and it seems like you would think that over time I would just get more and more used to it. I would able be able to do more, but as my capacity expands, they just bring through more energy. So it's right. not, you know what I mean? It's, it's, yeah. They never and let also, it just sit. You become more sensitive to understanding what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Yeah, totally. Totally. So yeah. tell me a little bit about, so how did it even start for you? Or were you born channeling? <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, I remember, I remember being a little kid and being in bed, like going to bed at night and, and thinking, hearing somehow in my own head, not understanding, because I was like five, not understanding that it wasn't me, but having this awareness of, of thinking like, what am I going to do when I grow up? And somebody saying, you're going to uh, help people live better. Huh. And, and as a little kid, I, I laughed out loud and I'm like, well, how do I'm only five? How do I do that? You know, it was this aware, like as a kid, I remembered very specifically. And I know now that it was a conversation with my guides, but at the time, you know, it was, to me, it was just me talking to whatever, you know what I mean? I was just yeah. a kid, 
But then as I grew older, you know, like all of us do, I went through my process of, of closing down my perception and there was things I didn't want to see. So I closed my third eye and all of that. And so it wasn't till I went through um, a very karmic awakening that really kind of kicked me in the rear and helped me to wake up again. Um, and so, you know, I think we all have those difficult experiences that, that help us to, um, yeah, to, to come out of our slumber. And so, yeah, but so the process of wakening up to channel was multiple steps. Yeah. And I'm happy to share with you what it felt like and how it came in. Yeah. I do want to hear that. Where are you from? Where were you, this San little Diego. girl in bed in San yes. Diego? Mm -hmm. And so then what were the things that you were seeing that you didn't want to see? So you kind of made a point of shutting them down. Yeah. I mean, there was certainly my energy, like, like our process of healing is a process of balance. Like we're trying to get into balance. We're trying to bring our masculine and our feminine energies into balance and we get thrown out of whack. You know, usually we come in, we bring in on purpose, we bring in energies that help to grind, ground us to the planet. So we come in out of balance and then we have childhood experiences to help that help anchor those experiences into our physiology. And so for me, there was things in childhood that I got really out of balance, like both on, on both sides. But the first thing I really had to heal was my masculine energy. And so that was part of it. And then as I went through life, like I had, you know, the traumatic first marriage, which was pretty disastrous. <laughs> If you know what I mean? And there was a lot of stuff I was trying not to see. So I shut, I shut down and, uh, and it, it was funny, like how incredibly, like that relationship was super karmic. Like I had loads of dreams about it later showing me like how I had been married to this person in a past life and my children had been there and like, I'd saw it all like, and how this was so intentional. And so a big part, like a big first step for me was the, the anchor that I had brought in was needing to forgive. I needed to forgive mm. him. And so I had to create a circumstance that made it really hard for me to forgive him. And then I had to forgive him. And that was a journey of all on its own. Did yeah. you notice things through your childhood where you just were not great at forgiving? Um, not so much. Like this was an isolated experience of one special, special thing <laughs> that was planned just for me. But it was, no, childhood, like I was... I would say as a kid, I was, you know, I was that, I was super happy kid. My mom always called me sunshine. I was, mm. you know, very optimistic. I always came, I came in a, like very, like, like, even though I know that I grew up with, you know, as much trauma as we all have as a kid, I seemed sort of oblivious to it. I kind of was just happy, you know? And if anybody had asked me like, oh, did you have a hard, hard childhood? I would have been like, no, I was super happy. And it wasn't until <laughs> I started ex excavating my wounds and seeing all this stuff come up that I realized, wait a minute, there's all this stuff that, uh, that was under the surface that, that had me, you know, coming to conclusions about myself. Uh, you know, at all these places where we put in all of our blocks and limitations, yeah. things where we say, okay, this is, I have to behave in this way in order to be loved and accepted. So right? what were some of yours? Like what were some of your, you know, the hardest and things yeah. that you looked at yourself in a certain way? Yeah. I think that, that for me, um, like codependence was definitely an issue. The feeling that I had to manage my environment in order to, um, to find love and acceptance that I mm. had to, you know, to try to create harmony around me that I had to change me in order to be more acceptable. You know, I had to be like, I didn't want to disturb anybody. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to ask for too much. I didn't want to, uh, to make things hard for others because, you know, there was that underlying fear of not being wanted. And so, and I think that's, you know, we all have that, some flavor of that, mm -hmm. you know, and for me, it was, it was that. So it was then having to unlearn that, ha having to unlearn the, the instinct to read another person's emotions and then try to manage the environment to try to make them happy. Do you know what's what I mean? so interesting is I'm assuming if you're someone who channels and you were yeah. hearing this stuff since you were a kid, you're, you're just naturally can read someone's emotions very easily. Oh. 100%. So yeah. it's harder to like train yourself because if you have it in the beginning, of course, you don't realize that you're not supposed to do anything to make it better because you're a kid. Yeah, yeah that's that exactly just, right. Right. It gets so ingrained in you because you're, you hear and feel their emotions probably before most people would. Uh, yeah. And it's so funny. I got rewarded for it as a kid too. Like it was right. my instinct to come into a space and I would immediately tune into the everyone 
And I would feel those people who were feeling out of place or feeling not included. I know and it's so, so tricky. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's and so, so then I that's would, a beautiful yeah. quality too. Yeah. Like, oh, I mean, yeah. it's a beautiful thing to make people feel comfortable, but there's always mm -hmm. that fine line. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so you were and it rewarded. Was, it was, yeah. Yeah. And it would be that thing like, oh, she's so diplomatic and she's so, so inclusive and all these nice things. But, but it was also, it was the positive expression of a negative self-belief. Yes. Yeah. And so then I'm assuming you took that into your marriage. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. And, and then if I got married twice, I'm becoming like very worldly. I'm collecting my marriages, but <laughs> you and everyone else. <laughs> Two is good. I'm good with that. But in any case, the, uh, they were both very karmic and the first one was not, not so much that wound came into play in my second marriage. The first marriage was really all about forgiveness. And that was, and that, that was a big one. And I think forgiveness is something we really have a hard time with because I think we think that it is something that we're going to, um, that somebody's going to say something that's going to make us feel better, that you there's going to be an apology that somehow fills that void, you know, and there's not. No. And yeah. And the thing I finally realized was that what it requires is acknowledgement, is that I had to acknowledge to myself that it was true. And that's, you talk about what I was trying not to see, shutting down the, the third eye, is I had to come to the place. Because I think there's a part of us that when we get here, we think, you know, when we're on the other side, you would never imagine that somebody would do something so hurtful to you. Right. And then when you get here and it happens, you just can't, there's some part of you that just cannot wrap your head around it. You cannot accept oh, that because this Because your head is new at that point. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's like from the other side, you're your highest self. And so is every other energetic being around you. Yeah. And so then also yeah. you get plummeted and within seconds you realize, oh, we have a lot of choices here and you can <laughs> choose to act like a total dick. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. better words. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that was, you know, like at this point that the place I finally got to was the understanding, okay, the, the person that's going to fill that void in me is me by acknowledging everything that happened, that it was as true and my feelings were as true, you know, that, that it was all that I, I could validate it internally and accept it and say, yeah, I felt this way. This all happened. It was even worse than I imagined, right? To make it as bad as it actually happened. Yeah, this has really happened. Right. Not to make him bad, but to make my experience bad because mm. the bigger I made him, the worse it got. It was like, no. And, and then I came to a place of understanding that, that anytime anybody comes here, they, nobody wants to be the schmuck. Nobody no. wants to come in and be the bad guy. And so when I understand that this other person agreed to come in to help me to be the schmuck so that they could trigger this in me so that I could, I could heal and, and learn forgiveness and, and heal that karma that, that I may not like his earthly incarnation, but I can be incredibly grateful to his higher self and yes. to recognize that at the higher self level, this was a sacrifice on his part to come in and to be that person for me. And so I got to a place of forgiveness through those two main pieces. One was, was really coming to the place of acknowledging and, it, and, under, and telling myself, yes, it was true and getting to that place of accepting that. And then the second piece of it was understanding the role that he played was actually an incredible blessing because it is what woke me up, that it took me out of really a deep slumber. I know I tell people sometimes when they have those incredibly tough relationships, yeah. I'm like, look, in some ways you can be really like, you know, thankful to that person because not, not only are they like holding on to the agreement you agree to, they're doing it really well. <laughs> All right. I mean, they're real. They heard you. They heard you. But yeah. it is true. It's so hard. I mean, I've heard you talk a lot about, <clears throat> which I fully agree with this idea of, you know, losing judgment. And that's yeah. part of, you know, ascension or just raising your vibration or just, you know, hitting a place of kind of joy and centeredness is when you can get to a place of lack of judgment, which means like yeah. not putting the value system of good and bad on things. Yes. And I feel like it's really hard to do in the realm of forgiveness whenever something happened to you that really, really hurts. Yeah. But ultimately it's a version of that too. It's like, okay, if I took the good and bad out of it and just could start looking at it as moving pieces. Yeah. Do mm -hmm. I have the ability then to forgive? Cause then it's like the emotions out of it, which takes a while. That's hard. Um, yeah. but then you can see like, yeah, there's a lot of moving pieces and it's like, it's, you know, everyone's here to do something. And sometimes, you know, you can't control someone else's behavior because we have no clue exactly what that journey is about either.
Yeah. Yeah. Super true. And I think the idea of moving pieces, I think of understanding all the different components of what you're feeling. I think, I think what makes forgiveness so hard is our resistance to it, our resistance to having had that experience. And so it, it locks us into this pattern of pushing against the feeling of what it is that we don't want to have had it. <laughs> yeah. And so we fight it. And so that's why I think the acceptance is so hard. And it's, it's a profound level of acceptance. It's a getting into a place of telling your inner self, of having a dialogue with that inner self and being the witness to your own inner catastrophe and, and playing in that role for yourself. And think that is, and, and I think what we spend a lot of our time doing, what we struggle with is that we are trying desperately for it not to be true. Yes. Like if I just think hard enough, maybe it'll all change. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Or if I fight it, that's what we kind of, is the fight or flight. Either we, we stuff it down or we combat it, right? We keep looking for that same circumstance in the world and we keep fighting it and fighting it and fighting it. And that's us trying desperately not to have it be true. May I ask what you were doing as far as a day to day during this time of life? Like, did you have a job? Were you a stay at home mom? What was your? Yeah, yeah. So my, you know, my background was corporate. I worked at Microsoft, and and I was a, um, I worked on putting together these uh, uh, their agreements for their largest customers. And then when I left that, I had children. I left that, and I was in this period of in between where I was home with the kids. I was I was flipping houses. Is what I was doing. I was building houses. Um, it did a bunch of different things in that time, trying stuff I could do when I could be home with the kids. But at the time of the ending of the marriage, I was at that point home with the children. And then after that, I went back into the corporate world. Yeah. And so then walk me through. So that marriage is done. You're, yeah. you're as, you know, there's nothing channely about you at this point. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I knew I was psychic, like I knew, but I didn't know how to access it. It was one of those things that would be like, Oh, look at that cool psychic thing that just happened. But, but how I did you know you were psychic? Happen. Like what were the things? I think it was just an awareness. Like I just, I just, I just like my dad, my birth dad was like into astrology and into palm reading when I was a kid. So I kind of had a little bit of an inkling that this stuff was out there. I remember when Shirley MacLaine's, uh, uh, show came on TV and I wanted to watch it so badly. And like, my, my mom was like, nah, that's just junk. You don't want to watch Garbage. that stuff. Yeah. I know you can see that, but there was, and there was a book I read that had uh, one of Ronald Dahl's book that had uh, books that had a, the story of Henry Sugar, which was about a guy who could see, you know, he went to like India and learned how to see through without his eyes. And so I had a few inklings of what this was. And I just felt this inner conviction that, yeah, that's me. And I didn't know why. I just felt that. And then there would be all the random things. It'd be like, I'd be putting my keys in the door and a voice would say, you're going to drop your keys. And then I would drop the keys. And it would be stuff like that all the time. So you hear. Like, um, is that I do how it now, always was for you? I do now. Like I will have, it's just, it's literally like a, it's very, very obviously not me, but it doesn't, it, it rarely comes in as words. Once in a while, it comes in as like the booming voice in the room, but that's rare very rare. Most of the time it is a, it is literally like somebody is talking into your head and you can hear it. Like it's, it's, it is very, um, persistent is the way I would describe it. It's a persistent thought or persistent word that, and it's funny, like when I first started channeling in the beginning, I would open up to just one word at a time because I was trying to keep my head out of it. I was trying to make sure that I wasn't, it wasn't coming from anywhere in me. So I'd just be like one word and a word would like come down a pipe, you know, and I would see the word. And if I didn't say the word or write it down, the word would just get stuck in the pipe and it would just stay there and hang there until finally I wrote it down, you know, or said it. And then the flow would start again. But yeah, but it's a persistent voice. So when was the first time this started happening for you? So, um, I, so I was channeling before I was trans channeling. So the, it first came in as clairvoyance was the first, when I first started tuning in and I had that body awareness and the awarenesses of like, you're going to drop your keys, stuff like that. But then I started and it was really just through the like, oh, I guess I could do this. And it came in where, um, I remember I went to my first channeling retreat and, uh, or like into intuition retreat or whatever it was a three day weekend. And we were doing stuff in the class, but what was fun for me was the time in between the class. We had like two hours and we were sitting out on the patio and I was like, let's just experiment because I want to know if this stuff works. Like a lot of people will channel and they'll be like, your past life from 10 years ago, you know, 10 centuries ago was this, and you have no way of validating that. 
Right. So I said, okay, so let's, let's make this, let's test ourselves. I said, okay, let's, we don't know. And we know nothing about ourselves. Here's six of us sitting around. We just met. We know nothing about each other. I said, let's see if we can find out anything about each other and just test ourselves. So let's see, okay, anybody has a partner or a spouse. So we went around the circle and I was smack dead on every single time. And it blew my mind. I was like, wow, like this thing I'm doing is real. So it'd be like, I would, I would saw, I saw a person. I said, okay, I see your partner. I see him to the left of you. And he's pointing to his shoes and he's got these really funky vintage tennis shoes on. And she laughs and she says, yeah, my partner has a collection of 250 vintage pairs of tennis shoes. It's his thing. And so it'd be random, right? But, but, but incredibly you can validate it. Right. And, and then when I started channeling more intensively, when I start, I started doing it all the time, then they, like, I think, my guides and angels know that I needed at that time, I needed that validation. So I would channel in the morning and then I would go out in the day and I would see something that showed up in the channeling. I would see it out in the world, something very specific. So give me an example. So then after this kind of retreat where you took the experiment on yourself, you went home and were like, I'm going to just keep working on this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. And, and it happened very quickly that people started showing up at my door for healing. It would be like, okay, people started with friends wanting me to do healing on them. I knew that I, I knew like I was working on my dreams. I knew from my dreams that I was a hands-on healer, that I was a psychic healer. So I just started doing it. I just started opening up and trying and being very experimental. I'd always just say like, hey, let's just see. I don't know what's going to happen. Let's just try it. But it was remarkably accurate. So what would happen when I first, when I was like, when I was trying to really open up the channel. So for example, in the beginning, um, Neptune <laughs> kept showing up for me over and over again. And it would be a thing where I would go into channel and I would see, uh, um, it would start out and I would have all of a sudden this vision of Neptune standing on a beach holding his spear. And I would be like, that's random. Like, what's, what's that about? And then it would go on from there. And then that day I would go out to lunch and I'd go to the building where I'm meeting a friend and two feet high on the side of the building is a massive painting of Neptune holding the spear. <laughs> You know, and it happened again, like same thing with Neptune, where I was trying to mail back, I was trying to return a package to Amazon and the fulfillment center was, I was in San Diego at the time, the fulfillment center was on the UCSD campus. And I was wandering around for like 30 minutes trying to find this building. I had no idea where it was. I finally find the door and there, right? In, and, and that morning I had meditated and again, Neptune had come in, but this time he was holding the spear and a conch shell. And 30 minutes wandering around, carrying this huge box, I finally find the door right in front of it, a like 10 foot tall statue of Neptune holding, or Poseidon, holding the conch and the, and the spear. Wow. And so this would happen. The funniest was one where it was, uh, uh, I, I go into meditation and I was in Canada at the time visiting a friend and my son had asked me to buy him this one brand of cookies. And I'd been driving everywhere trying to find this, this cookie brand. I could not find it anywhere. I go into meditation that morning. And, uh, and I see uh, a whole group of, of these sort of, you know, like men in white robes they are always, I don't know why they were men. Maybe that's my own, like my own inner, you know, gender prejudice conditioning or something. But in any case, these were men in white robes and, and, uh, and they come forward and they're, and all of a sudden Jesus walks in and he's got this rolled up, you know, like it looks like building plans. And he says, I've got the plan. And of course I'm excited, like, wow, I get to see the plan. And there's this big round warble table and he, he spreads it out and everybody's gathering around to look at the plan. And I'm like, wow, like I get, what is the plan? And I'm looking at it and I cannot make heads or tails of it. It looks like a great big map of the world. And it has the oceans are pale yellow and the continents are all royal blue. And there's one red flower, like a poppy right in the middle of France. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, okay, what? Like somebody explain this and they all walk away. And I'm like, wait, like I didn't get, it. I didn't get the plan. Like, what was this? And then the meditation goes on from there. So then that day I'm out driving with my friend and out of the blue on the side of the road is this billboard that is that exact board, exactly like I saw it. It's the risk board. It's the yellow, the yellow water, like the exact thing. And I, I'm like, oh my gosh, stop the car. And directly across the street is a huge grocery store with a sign painted across the side, home of the blah, blah, blah cookies. Oh so, my God. So yes, Jesus has a sense of humor. He's also it very the, kind. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it was the plan to get the cookies. So, but yeah, so, so anyways, lots of experiences. And the point was to show me to trust what I was getting. It was teaching me to trust it. And so once you started trusting it, did your dialogue change? Did your rapport change? It's how you do it change? It was, a, it, it's always changed. It's never been the same. And I knew like, for example, with the trans channeling, I knew that 
that when you was, say trans channel, cha- mm-hmm. channeling, what do you mean by yeah. that? Just that by it- that I go into a, a deeper meditative state, and that's when I start getting the specific words. So this was all visual in the beginning. It was all visual. It was body sensation. So it was claircognizance, clairvoyance, clairsentience was how I was predominantly working in the beginning. So I would do healing sessions, and I would go in, and I still use this. I you know go in, and I would see things, and I would feel things and know things. But then I knew there was this added layer coming in, which was the words. And and to do that, to access that, I go in and I I let them speak through me. So they take over my they take over my voice and they speak through. And uh, and they there was a period where I knew this was coming in, and they uh, they started working on my vocal cords. And there was a period of about four months where I had no voice. And wow. there was nothing wrong with me. I would be able to talk for about 20 minutes and then nothing. I literally couldn't make a squeak. And did you know this was happening? I mean, what made you be like, yes, I got to start figuring out how to go into a deeper trance so I can have this <laughs> other connection? There was one of the things I use a lot for me in terms of, uh, so I'll use my dreams. So I've, I'll under, I can under, read my dreams and see where I'm being guided and what I'm being told. Um, and that's, that's been a very, very helpful source of information. So my dreams were, so the sign to be a trans channel in your dreams is sleepwalking, that you're walking around in your sleep. And so it was very clear that I was a, a, a trans channel and it was coming through in, when I was doing the meditation, it was like, okay, you're going to be, you need to be doing this. You need to be doing this kind of transfer, you know, travel sharing of information. Wait, so if you're so, someone in your dreams, so wait, are you that in your dream, you're sleepwalking or you're a yeah. sleepwalker? No, no. In your dream, you dream about sleepwalking. It's, you dream about sleeping and in your dream, you wake up from your dream <laughs> and you're sleepwalking. So and it's like a double dream. Wait, yeah. That's really interesting. And that's a sign. Well, that's, that's like, one of the, by the way, anyone who's listening, there you go. If you yeah. dream yeah. like that, yeah. pay attention. Then exactly. Then you have that specific, you're meant to, to use that. And everybody has spiritual gifts. Everybody has at least one, if not several spiritual gifts, right. but that happens to be mine. So one of the, the, one of the ways I was meant to connect. So, but yeah, so, so then I started and, and in terms of turning that on, like I knew they had worked on my vocal cords. I knew that I was ready. I just didn't know how to start. And so one day I just sat down and I just tried it and I, I just tuned in. I just, I went in and I, I meditated, I got deeply connected and then I just raised my frequency as high as I could. And then I just, I just let whatever words came through, came through one at a time. And I, at first I was very, very like, I'm like, keep it slow. One word. Cause I wanted to keep my head <laughs> out of the picture. And as I did it, what came through, I thought it was just nonsense. I thought it made no sense at all. And it was just word, word, word. And then I got to the end. I did it for 15 minutes. I get to the end and I thought that nah, that was, that didn't work at all. That was garbage. And I get back and I, and I read it and it was profound and it was a hundred percent meaningful. And so that, that first, mind. do you remember that the, first channel? I don't, I don't remember what they said. I should have kept it. I don't think I, I don't think I kept it in the beginning. It was, like I said, it was slow and very deliberate. And in the beginning, yeah. And it was, it was the, they gave me a couple like nice, nice messages. And then literally like once I was realizing that this was, this was how to do it, then it was like, they didn't waste any time. And it was kind of scary because they came in almost immediately. I would say like five messages in, they started giving me all kinds of information about the Ascension and earth events and all this kind of stuff. And it was like, you must share this information. And it was like, Ooh, yeah. So that was almost right away. So when, what's your method of raising your vibration? So for me now, in the beginning, what I would do, so if, if people are curious, what I would do in the beginning is in order to change my state, I would go into gratitude. It's the fastest, most accessible method to, to change your state and to get into a very high frequency. So just immediately, just if you can't, especially if you come in, you're like, I got to meditate now, or I got, I got a session or whatever. And I had to get into a really positive frame of mind, boom, gratitude. So you just sit there and you think about things that make you feel great. <laughs> and then from there, and these days it's easier. These days I'm just pop. Like I just go up, but at the time it was work. So a gratitude. And then from there you visualize yourself and you can almost feel it bodily. If that helps feel yourself sort of floating upward. And then you go up to a place where you can almost like you're looking up the top of your head and you go as high as you can go, pause there and take a breath and then see if you can push it just a little higher. And it feels painful. If you feel pain, you're doing the right thing. <laughs> it hurts. When you connect with the angels, in the beginning to me, it felt like someone, it felt like my, being underneath, like at the bottom of a very deep pool. It felt like intense pressure. It would come over like a helmet. It would come down to about here. 
And it would literally be like putting on a physical helmet and it was squeezy and uncomfortable. And these days it's not. These days it's just like a gentle pressure right on my crown. It's, very, it's no problem at all. But in the beginning, for sure, internal, until I adjusted, it was definitely painful. So as you're trying to lift your, raise your awareness, go into that to the, just below the place where it starts to push and squeeze and feel uncomfortable. And then just see if you can ease into that a little higher. That's huge. Thank you. I'm sure everyone, yeah. you're going to see everyone at home being like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you in the beginning, when they first started to connect with me, before I understood what was going on, like I forgot this whole part, which is actually funny and important is that, uh, one of the ways I knew I was meant to be doing this is that every day I would go out, I would sit on the, uh, I'd sit in the out, uh, like outdoors on the patio to meditate. And, uh, and then one day I go in to meditate and all of a sudden, and I was doing a lot of healing at the time, like working as, as a healer, but my guides would always come in through the rear. They'd come in through my back. And then all of a sudden I go to meditate and someone sits on me, like a guide sits on me. And I'm like, what is going on? And it is, it is heavy. They're on my forehead and on my chest. And it felt literally like it was so physically, I could barely breathe. It was literally like a 300 pound guy sitting on you. It was what it felt like, but just here and here. And like, I couldn't breathe. And I just wow. sat there. I'm like, what are you guys doing? Like, I thought well, you're trying to come in. I assume they were trying to come into my body. I'm like, come in the back. Like, what do you guys just come in already? Like, why squish me? Like, I could not make heads or tails of it. And this went on for about six months. The minute I would go in to meditate, boom, pressure. And I, it was six months. And I would just sit there and try to breathe for, for 30 minutes or whatever, nothing. And then that would be it. And I couldn't figure it out until finally it dawned on me that they weren't trying to come in. They were trying to lift me up. And that what I was feeling was the G-forces of that, the shift in my own frequencies that my angels were trying to, to guide me to go wow. up towards them. And so then I finally got it. One day I just, I stopped, I just, I, I just literally just allowed, I allowed myself to be lifted and then boom, I was like shooting straight up. And then I was there and I could see all of them. I'm like, oh my gosh, wow, this is so great. Okay, let's talk. And I'm listening and it's crickets, like nothing happened. And so I, and this, then this was another six months of me going up and like waiting for something to happen and being like, how do I make something happen and nothing. And then I finally did this, sit on the sofa and let them speak, you know, sit down and write. And that was when it, it all clicked for me, but it took, it was not clear at so all. Wait, you it go took me up. I love that. And I think that's really important information for everyone. So you go up, how many angels were there? Is it all angels? Is it some guides? Like who was there for you? Yeah, the my primary my primary the people that I channel I channel from the angelic realm. And I say people, but angels are they've given us a whole bunch of information that they aren't like people at all, that they are like an essence. That angels are and they're deeply intertwined with us that we have that essence inside of us that they are an aspect of the, of source of the divine and so are we. We are different. We are they we they are the light of the divine. And and we have his creative spark. So it's very different but they are like us and they're intertwined with us and they are an essence. And we think of them as archangels and these different, different personalities or different qualities. And each of those is like a, 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 they can, they can embody. So say you call Archangel Gabriel, one of my favorites, you can call that particular essence and it can like even congeal into form and you can be like, that's him. That's my guy. Right. Or you can call uh, people who see angels like, yes, it's real. Like you, you can, they can personify. But it's almost like that energy is all around us and it just congeals into form and then dissipates. And it's everywhere, all at once. Like angels, the angelic essence is in everything, everywhere, all at once. Yeah. Do people have specific, is everyone assigned an angel or two angels? What's, what do they say to you about that? Yeah, there's absolutely a guardian angel. And that guardian angel, people think of the guardian angel as standing behind them, but it's much more intertwined with you. So it comes in, but it's not, so it's not, it's, it can never be separated from you because it's almost like it's part of your body. So your, your guardian angel, yes, and has the personality and all that kind of stuff. Like you, you can speak to your guardian angel and communicate with them. Um, so, so absolutely everyone has a guardian angel. And then, and then in terms of who has what guides, very likely that there are angels among your guides. And those angels are, are incredibly helpful. They help in different ways than other types of guides. So I work predominantly with the angels and I have, uh, I work with, so there's different schools of angels. There are those angels that are tied, those aspects of the angelic realm that are tied to the earth world, to this realm. And then there are those that are not. And so it's helpful for me that I can work with both because the angels that are part of the earth school have to live by earth rules. 
and they have a very a lot of limitations around what they can do. And the angels that come from off earth don't. So there's a lot of healing that I can do that it gives me the access to 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 do more depth of healing than I could if I was working with the earth school angels, which I, I work with both. And what is the, without sounding crass, like what's the point of an earth school angel then? Like what do they, why do they have to come in this form? What's the, what's the reason for that? Why, why be, why be limited to, so the for free will is a big one is that we coming here, we come for a very specific purpose, which is to, 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 we are that we embody that spark of the divine. And the goal is for us to, to express that spark, to see what that spark does in this particular context that we are in and to understand through that process to learn and to see ourselves more clearly, and then to share that information back to the universe and to the divine. And so, so the concept of free will is essential. We have to be within this karma construct. We, we, we deliberately create situations for ourselves that mirror back to us the unpleasantness that's inside of us, right? We, it's, it, everything starts with us. And so the angels abide by a very specific set of rules. For example, they can't help us unless we specifically ask. And <clears throat> so there's a lot of, a lot of things around that, that, that limit the scope of what they do. So I'd say the earth school angels, and it's, it's madly important. It's incredibly huge. One of the biggest things they do is give us a glimmer of hope is that when people are down and they have it, like humans have a, have a, have a con like the thing that humans tend to do is we get very stuck <laughs> in seeing things in a particular way. And it's like, we have our head down and it, the answers to what we need could be literally right in front of us, but we are filled with so many no's and so much disbelief. And we get so sucked into the daily stuff of our life that we, we just don't look, we don't see it. So there could be all of these, this help right there. And what angels do is like, they breathe in a breath of like, they, they wake us up for a second. And they breathe in that little glimmer of hope of like, wait a minute, you could see, have you ever had that where you've just felt like so crushed and so down? And for whatever reason, out of the blue, you almost feel like, wait a minute, there's something possible. There's something, there is an answer that I could reach for. And it's, and it's almost like hard to hold on to. It's like right there, you could just kind of reach and that's an angel. And that's what they do for us. And they do that all the time. And, and angels on the earth will frequently work through other people where just when you're at your lowest, where somebody shows up and does something amazing for you or just gives you, they give you hope. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it is an incredible, incredibly important way of steering us back onto our path. And as a <clears throat> human, do you have like one of each or are you like, how does it work as far as your angel, like your guardian they, angel? Yeah. Well, you have the, 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 most people will only ever encounter earth school angels. The non, the ones that are not part of the earth school don't typically hang out here. Like it's not, that's kind of the point. Like the, the ones that are here are earth angels. Got it. And so the other ones are ones, and I don't know why, like, why is it that I have that relationship? I don't know, <laughs> but I'm happy for it. I'm happy for it. Um, and then, but yes, everybody has a guardian angel. And, and here's the other thing is, is there are loads of angels that are just kind of like, remember angels, it's an essence, it's everywhere that there are bonus angels and bonus guides that are unattached that are waiting to help. Um, and, oh, I love and that. yeah, absolutely. And angels are amazing with, um, angels, a lot of angels have never been incarnated. Some very few angels have, they have been incarnated, but most never have. So they're not as like angels have no sense of time at all. They'll just be like, it's happening now. And now is like <laughs> 10 years. years. From now. You just don't know. <laughs> you know, you're like, okay, that's thanks. That's helpful. But, um, but, <laughs> but, uh, but God, like your guides often aren't there. There's a lot of non-angel guides and guides could be, they could be ascended masters. They can be your uncle Fred who passed over. They can be your guides or anyone who has graduated from the earth school who has formerly human. And they have a much more tangible understanding of what happens here. So, so depending on what you need help with, like if you are trying to find something very specific, if you're trying, like if you need a marketing plan for your business, ask your guides. That's what your guides are for. If you need inspiration, if you need healing, if you need love, if you need something that think about what someone could experience from the divine realm, that's where the angels are amazing. Are they ever together? So like when you call them up, like, is there ever like, and do they have any relationship? Like do guides poke fun of angels for not quite under 
standing <laughs> stuff. <laughs> this is my TV brain. <laughs> Yeah, my there's, I mean, world. like, yeah, my, so my angels are very, very careful with my connection. So they, they very, very rarely will they allow anything other than an angel to speak through me. So they guard that connection. But in a session, like, for example, I don't, I don't see dead people, not usually. The only time I will see someone who's crossed over is if they are immediately in someone's field because they just crossed, or if that person is trying to serve as a guide. And when they do, then the they will speak through the angels who speak to me. So there is they definitely mm, can see each higher. other and yeah. And so so the angels control who comes through. Um, and so there are some people who are tuned in specifically to the free. So it's like frequencies. What the, I'm like a radio. And what mm -hmm. frequency do you attune to? I am attuned to angels. There are some people who are tuned to people who have crossed over and they're mediums. And that's a very different gift. Um, and it's just like I said, it's a different different number on the dial. So. Um, yeah. So when you talk to your angels, have you ever asked them? I'm sure you have had this conversation about why for you or what was like, I'm assuming this was preordained before you entered yeah. this life, especially if you're hearing it. So can you talk yeah. a little bit about what you know about that for you? Yeah. Like why I, why I'm working with angels or why, or how, how it all got planned. Yeah. All yeah. It. The, yeah. The planning. Yeah, exactly. I think it has to do with who I am as a soul and what I do on the other side is that this is who my natural relationships are with. For whatever reason, this is where, like, I know it's related to that. I've seen, I've had loads of dreams about planning this life and about before coming in. And I know I hadn't been here for a while. I know that, that coming in, I was like, I had one specific dream where I was visiting the earth plane before being born. And I was super excited to be among humans again. <laughs> mm. So, um, and I remember, it, yeah. I was going to say, what did it look or feel like if so, the dream is taking place in the beyond? On that side, that every time I have dreams where I'm on the other side, I, in the dream, I feel um, without any friction whatsoever. Imagine you mm. at your most balanced self feeling so full of life and so full of, of, the, there's a feeling that the, there is nothing in your way ever. Like you're completely free and full of energy. And I guess that's the best way to describe it. You feel empowered isn't even, because empowerment, any word that we have to describe it carries with it an opposite. There's a, po there's a, there's a, a positive expression polarity. and a negative expression of polarity. But to be empowered means that sometimes you feel unempowered or disempowered. And that it's not like that. It's just, a, there's so, it's hard to put a word on it except to feel like there is no friction in your life whatsoever, that you can do anything. And you feel like so um, uplifted and positive and full, like it's like literally like you have the energy of a whole universe inside of you and you're just, you're good with it, you know? And when you did your little visit, was that like a reconnaissance? Yeah. Yeah, it was so, so, and that was one dream where I came in and I'm literally, I'm honest, when you dream about spaceships, you're dreaming about your guides. Anything that you aliens is about your guides. So any kind of, because they're foreign, there's something like guides, guides are hard for us to wrap our heads around. So when you dream about that, you're dreaming about your guides and anybody who shows up as an alien is in fact your guide. Um, but I, in my dream, I'm on a spaceship and I'm in the front of the spaceship and I'm, I'm in the, like the observation part and I'm flying around and I'm seeing people and I'm reaching out and I'm reaching out with my hand in the room and I'm touching them, which is showing me that I'm going to bring the gift of hands-on healing. Um, in, uh, as I came and I did not because I'm meant to be a hands-on healer, but it was an important part of my healing journey. It helped me to regulate my own masculine energy to use that gift. But, um, but yeah, so I, the, I think one of the coolest dreams I had about, uh, uh when I was on the other, uh, a dream about planning this life was I saw myself with one of my guides and we are, uh, are preparing, um, looking at a film strip. And we're looking at a particular scene and it's like frame by frame. We're mm. playing the same scene over and over and over again, trying to make sure that it turns out exactly the way it needs to turn out. So we're talking about it and we try it one way. And then in the dream, I jump into the scene and I act it out. And then I jump back out and we talk and we, you know, is this like, how did it turn out? What do you think? Should we change something? And then we say, okay, let's try it this way. And then I jump back in and we act it out. And I, and I, and the, the feeling in the dream was we did this 
over and over and over rehearsing. And I think this is how we plan the most important meetings in our life, the most important experiences of our life. How do you know when you meet your soulmate, how do you know that you're going to run into them and you're going to say the right thing and you're not going to put your foot in your mouth? It's because you've rehearsed that meeting 50 billion times so that it is so wired into you that you can't mess it up. Do you remember and what the scene was? They didn't show me. It was more like an understanding of this is how it works. The point of the dream was, this is how this works. Do you feel like just in your body that that scene has taken place yet? Um, like I think in that particular dream, like I said, I don't think they were showing me the planning of a particular scene. I think it was more that they were showing me that this that, is- The ins and outs. The ins and outs. That basically, that there, I think it was a reassurance to say, you can't mess this up is what it was. It was saying, look, there are certain things that, that you, that yes, we have free will and we have free choice within limits and that there's going to be a certain number of karmic experiences that are going to come your way that you are prepared for and you can't mess it up. So you were <clears throat> saying that you feel like you hadn't been here for quite a while. That's yeah. Been a lot of times between lifetimes. So yeah. what do you, do you have any idea or have you spoken to your angels about what it was about now, why you had to, or you chose to come? I know that there's, you know, that we're in the middle of a huge shift in our consciousness in human consciousness. It could be called the Ascension that we are in the middle of this right now. And we are heading into coming up some very difficult times. And there is what I would call the pre team and the post team. And the pre team is doing a lot of talking about it and doing a lot of healing, a lot of healing, because right now is a really unique time where we have the opportunity to heal at a very, very deep level. Right now in this life, right now in this incarnation, we have access to all of our past lives. And that was not normally the case. In all of our previous incarnations, we had access to those lives, which we needed to help us in that particular life. They were energies that we were deliberately bringing through or skills we were bringing through this life because there's so much support on the planet right now for healing, because this is the chance, like this is the, you know, the fire sale right now is the chance to encounter yourself, to experience your karma, to, to, to get yeah, to deal with all every, as much as you can. Um, uh, so because of that, there's an enormous number of healers who have come to the planet trying to help out. So that's the pre team is trying, and they're going to be super busy. You know, a lot of them will be super busy in the post team as well, but certainly that is a lot of the activity that's been happening. Then the post team is about how do we pick up from here? How do we redefine what it is to be human? How do we put down our boundaries? How do we welcome one another? And the biggest part about that, one of the biggest shifts we have to make is this idea of, of being willing to be seen, of being willing to open ourselves up and to allow ourselves to be seen at a very, very deep level and, and to be, as the angels call it, this still pool of water that has no judgment, no judgment, it starts with no judgment of the self, which is the elimination of all karma, which they said is that is a huge part of the ascension. And once we get to that, once we get to no judgment of self, elimination of karma, then we can see another and radiate only loving acceptance. And when we get to that space, we're open to unity and to oneness. And that's the goal. That's what we're trying to get to. And so, so this is the work of the post team. And I know I'm on both. <laughs> I'm on both teams. So yes. that's what I'm doing. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> How, and so in that, what, what's, is there a timeline with that, with the pre and post? Like, are you on both teams in this lifetime or is this yeah. something meaning you go and you come back for post? This is this lifetime. Yeah. It's in this lifetime. So you're straddling. We get to straddle. We're of the era. Mm -hmm. of we're in the stream. Is that yeah, what they exactly. call it officially? That's exactly right. <laughs> it's a huge deal to be here right now. Like just by being here, you have won the lottery. Like this is such a huge, huge time to be here because right now there is this opportunity to encounter yourself so deeply and to clear all this stuff and every little bit of healing that people accomplish in this life, they take with them. So they get to emerge from this life, a brighter, shinier soul than they have ever been. And so this is a really special time to be here. Now, is there a collective <clears throat> trauma? Because one of the things you said is it's being willing to be seen in the deepest way possible, which is yeah. so beautiful and is so fascinating because I think obviously everyone relates to it. But that's clearly like not a mandate, but that's a one idea, which means why collectively are we in a place that that's something we have to heal? Granted, we're healing it individually, but like what, yeah. what is it about? <clears throat> I think it has been, if you think about the willingness to be seen, that the reason we are unwilling to be seen is because we fear being judged. 
and we fear being judged because we judge ourselves. So this whole aspect of, of this, about the non-willingness to be seen, is the karmic construct. It is 3D reality. It is what we've been living in. And it was set up deliberately to allow us to, when we are in the process of judging ourselves, everything becomes self-reflective. We are turned inward, right? We're looking inside of ourselves and we're casting judgment at ourselves. And as we look inside, our, our gaze is source. Our, where we direct our focus, our focus, our attention is the divine spark that lives inside of us. And so when we turn that inward at ourselves, it is the creative power that we hold. So we look inward and that's what we create is more of this that we're looking at. So we're looking in at ourselves, we're judging ourselves and we're that then vibrates out and creates our reality. And that, so that is the construct we've been living in. And mm -hmm. it's been extremely helpful in terms of our growth of ourselves. So if we say, if, if you think of divine sourcing, how do I understand myself better? Well, I'm going to create an environment that is self-reflective where I then have to s s swim in my own stew in my own Shit. stew, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that is what we've been in. But now we are ready to move into this new state of awareness. And that's what the Ascension is all about, where we are no longer in this state of self-reflection, where we're looking inward, we're turning that creative gaze outward. And, and so this is the higher state of conscious we're trying to get to. And it's a process. It's, we don't get there all at once. We can maybe hold it in moments, right? In the beginning, you might hold it for a half hour and then something happens and triggers you and you're looking back in again, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So, but even in those half hours, we're, it's still amazing. And that then informs the collective. And the goal we're trying to get to is to shift the collective consciousness of humanity. Because at the end of the day, we are one organism in the human body. We are one organism, that one organism are, we are like the neurons of the earth and that we in our soul, in our, in our bodies, we belong to the earth. So when we can harmonize as one being, right, which is this idea of becoming open to one another, imagine all of your cells becoming open to one another and communicating and having this sort of nirvana in your body and how that creates perfect health. That is what we're trying to do for the earth. We're trying to open to one another, create a harmony between us, which is the perfect balance of our masculine and our feminine and a perfect balance and acceptance of one another. And then that then reverberates out through the entire earth and the earth then experiences that oneness, right? And we then at that point can then shift and move out into the universe. Yeah. And it's so interesting because as you've said, and I've heard <clears throat> before too, like we are at one of the highest points of consciousness that we've been at for a long, long, long time. Yeah. Um, but yet, like you said, it is a weird feeling of a tipping point because yes, we are all one and we're all interconnected. And even within one organism, there's, you know, we're on the earth. So there's extremes and polarities because that's part of this planetary makeup, correct? Totally. So, but it's interesting how we are so, it's almost like in the last, you know, five years, we've become even more extreme as far as so far that it's, it's so hard for people to accept. So like, I feel like, yeah. At least that's one of the things I noticed. That was the hardest thing for me during COVID and then all this stuff afterwards was what, like, wow, people just refuse to accept each other. Now, look, for good reason. Yeah. The points of views got so extreme. So it's really hard for someone extreme to be okay with someone else extreme and for that extreme to be okay with that. But it was <laughs> like, so you could see it. You could understand the why, but it was almost like, so when you hear that this is the calling, you're like, well, how does that bridge happen? Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. That is like, we are in a period of such incredible polarity on the planet. And, and that is like, how do we get from that to oneness? And that polarity is the root of it is judgment, right? And all yes. judgment is about judgment of the self because everything is a reflection of what we feel internally. And 100%. so, yeah. So it gets back to that idea of people fighting what it is they don't want to see about themselves. It's just so frustrating because whenever you meet it, yeah. people like that, and we've all met. I mean, so many people are like that. It's not <clears> like there's just that one horrible person who was on the corner. I mean, a lot of people yeah. hold so much judgment. Yeah. And you can see it so clearly. Like you can see yeah. it and be like, just shift, just this little thing. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because you just, get it. Can I just turn that on you? Can I? Because <laughs> really that's all it is. Yeah. It's like it one is. little mindset tweak. Yeah. That would not only make them feel, oh my God, I can, oh. I almost feel it in my whole body, how my whole body just yes. relaxes thinking about it. Cause I can't imagine the tension you hold when you have yes. that much judgment for yourself and therefore then others, but you're yeah. like, God, just that little tweak. Not only will you personally just feel so much better, right? That the, the, the energy from what, even what you're saying that will then be pushed out is 
and magnified is so big. Yes. And it's just like a tiny little <laughs> thing, but it's so far away for most people. It is. It is. And you know what I think? I think that that if you think about how much this has become a thing, how huge this has become, how how there has been so much polarity, things that were, and I, I see this as a, as a healing. I see this as these experiences, the Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, all of these, these issues existed and they were, they were there under the surface and they yep. weren't talked about. And in the same way that when we want to heal ourselves, we have to bring things up to the surface and feel them in order to let them move through our body. That I think is what is happening to humanity is that we are taking these issues, which are very large, which are, that, that hold a lot of suffering, a lot of pain. And we're bringing those up to the surface to be seen. And that, and that is why it's playing out on this much larger, you know, forum is that it is a process of the human body, the, the, you know, the humanity healing deep wounding. And so I think it's just part of these energies that are helping the planet. So I see it, even though it's difficult to live through and it's frustrating, it is, I think the experience of healing happening. And there has been massive shifting huge. because of it, you know, huge shifting. And that is uh, as a direct result of the fact that we are willing to go there, that we're willing to encounter these truths that exist in humanity. So talk about kind of this influx of like, you know, pre-team, post-team angels yeah. coming on to the, like, I'm sure healers, angels, probably a lot of other helpful beings, which I'd love to hear about that are here to support yeah. us, but also talk about this idea that, like you said, it's a huge time to be here, which means there's a reason for every single person, right? Uh -huh. So when you look at the, the, and I hate even saying that because nothing's bad. Again, everything serves a purpose, but using yeah. black and white language for a second to make it easier to speak about. When you look at some of these like really negative forces, these people who are still holding on to really old ways of thinking or yeah. really negative things that we can see are clearly hurtful to people yeah. overtly, you know? Yeah. Um, Talk a little bit about that, that that also in a weird way is an important part of this evolution because why would someone choose that as the lifetime? Yes. So talk about that. And then I want to hear about all the fun, weird beings that are hanging out here with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the interesting thing is that, and this actually came up just recently. I think it was in, uh, it might've been in my last retreat or the last peace bathing session, but they talked about how it's like a rubber band. That if you have something in that in your life and you think about if you came into your life and you had what you would consider to be some incredibly difficult experiences, those experiences pull you to a depth, right? They pull you down. They pull your frequency down to a depth that then allows you to, because this is polarity, allows you to then rebound up to a much higher height that you might have achieved otherwise. So it is the extreme of the experience that then creates the potential for a higher high. And so, so those very, very dark experiences, so someone came in and, 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 you know, it can be that the people who are some of the most controversial, you know, tyrants and leaders of our time may be very highly evolved beings who chose to come in to create this polarity so that there could be the opposite reverberation. There could be the opposite experience of achieving a much higher high than would have otherwise been possible. And people, I mean, consciously is not the right word, but like that being is choosing to be part of the low, knowing that that is the rubber band effect that is going to help ultimately in evolution. Yeah. And I think that's not the case in all cases, but I think in many cases that that can be the case. So I think what that there the other are, case being there yeah, is, it is a true thing that there are dark energies on the planet and that's true and they exist. And I don't think that those energies will be able to make it through the ascension. I don't think, I think that they're very active right now because I don't think that they will be able to make it through and they're not, they're not happy about that. <laughs> so, so I do think that that, that, that is true. And I don't think it has to be part of your reality, but I, I do think it is out there. Yeah. And then talk about before, talk, we'll talk about a little bit of how there's other support here helping elevate the consciousness right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, in terms of support, there is a time because it's, it's very, so here's the interesting thing that, uh, I thought was super, super cool, um, that they, they said recently was that the, um, uh, that what right, right now, this shift is not, uh, something that can be done from the outside. It has to be done. It's an inside job. It has to be done from within humanity. 
that that we're, what we're trying to do is shift the collective consciousness. And that can only happen if you are a part of the collective consciousness. So which is why so many beings have incarnated. So a lot of that help and that support is actually in physical body right now, all around us. And those people mm -hmm. have come in and some of them are literally here living a totally normal life. And they are all they are doing is holding a high, high state of consciousness. And they're just there shining their light and vibrating at a high frequency and letting that permeate. And, and, and it affects like being in, if you come in and you're the light in the room, it, it helps, it brightens other people and it gradually shifts, but it also more importantly, shifts the collective, shifts the collective mind. And so, and certainly there are those people who are, you know, out there teaching and healing and talking and doing all that kind of stuff. And that's huge. And if that's their path, that's what they're doing. But there's a large number of people who are just here to anchor the light, to bring more light onto the planet. So that's, that's hugely supportive of this whole effort. If there's one thing that the angels say that if every single person did this every day, that would speed up, um, what we need to do here? Oh, I think it is to, uh, to allow, to allow is that so often out of our fear, we attempt to control and we feel safer when we're controlling, but all that that does is constrict. It constricts our feel. It constricts our experience. When we control, we are locked in old paradigms of what we know. And we're not open to seeing what's changing all around us. And that's going to be one of the biggest things with this ascension is it will be uh, it will be required of us to step out of what we know and to be open and to let go of everything that we have, the way that things have been, we have to let go of it. And so allowing means understanding that even though loss is incredibly scary for humans, that letting go of things that we've known and of the patterns of how do you succeed in the world? And that, you know, that's all this like stuff that we've planned on and those plans may need to change. And so how do you step into a space of letting go without fear and moving into a space of allowing? And it's challenging for humans, very challenging. But that would be the one thing, if we can embody the state of being in flow and allowing and trusting that you're going to be guided. And the crazy thing is about, about spirit is that what we want is we want them to show us the path and then we'll let go. We want to be like, great, I'll let go as soon as I see that there's oh, somewhere yeah. to go, you know, and it doesn't as work that way. As soon as I know way. it's okay, I'll let go. <laughs> as soon as I know it's okay, I'll let go. And they say, as, as long as you're holding on, you are in the old frequency and you can't shift. And so we can't have it our way. We have to be the ones that take the risk because it is us that are the creative force. So if we are holding on to what was, we are de facto unable to hold the new vibration. We have to be willing to step into the lurch and to let go of what is and to be in faith and trust and to allow and to allow what's coming to move through us. And if we do, then we're carried and we're supported. But if we're still grabbing on as tight as we can to the way things were, there's nothing they can do for us, right? We have to be willing to allow. So yeah, that I think is the biggest thing, the hardest thing, because it is leaping off a cliff and people don't like to do that. And talk about like this might be a weird question, but like, how do people know when it's their time to leap off a cliff? Meaning like, it's not that you have to just jump tomorrow and say, I don't care about anything. Cause some of the stuff you might be on the right path. You might be doing some things that are correct. Yeah. How do people know when they're holding on too tight and when they're supposed to be letting go? Um, think about everybody who is in a circumstance, a job, a relationship, any structure in your life where you're saying, well, I, I'm really unhappy here, but I need to fix this thing, whatever it is. I need to take care of my children. I need to have an income. I need to have whatever it is. I can't leave because I don't know how I'm going to support myself. I don't know how I'm going to, I don't know where I'm going to live, whatever it is, whatever it is that you're saying, this is why I cannot leave. That's, that's it right there. And that is the thing. And, and there, what the angels would say is that you cannot, it will not work until you leave. And you have to be the one that's willing to jump into the lurch. And that that you may be sitting there waiting and praying and praying and praying for help and your angels are all around you saying, please let us help you. But you are the one that has to let go and has to take the, lun the plunge. And it doesn't mean that it will be immediately better. It means that you'll go through two years of trying to figure it out, but you will always be okay. Like, and that's what I say when people freak out or worry about like, gosh, what, like, I don't know what's going to happen to me. I would say all of your life, you are still here, which means you have always had your basic needs met. If you are still alive today, it means that you have always been held. You've always been provided for. 
You've always had whatever you need to keep you alive. May not have been great, but you're still alive. And so you still will be alive. It will still, you will still be supported. And it will take a little while for you to adjust and for you to be able to hold the new frequency. But then it comes and then your life just gets so much better from there. So it is look into your life and see, is there anything that you're holding on to because you feel it's, it's safety related, that you feel like you have to, that you don't want to be there, but you feel like you don't have another choice. And I would say you do. You just don't like the choice right now because it looks scary. And then this may be redundant, but talk about what they would say specifically about then how to process fear. Yeah. And fear is, fear is definitely <laughs> difficult. <laughs> And I'd say that understanding one of the, yeah, one of the most important things about fear is we, we get fear because we, we fit, we process it as something that I have to do. So if I was to tell you that tomorrow, actually, let's say in two hours, an asteroid is going to hit the planet. And if I tell you that, and you say, there's nothing you can do in two hours, everything is going to be smushed, smushed, and it's an asteroid and you can't do a single thing to change it. You do not experience fear. What you experience is a sense of sadness, right? A sense of loss maybe, but not fear. And the thing that brings in the fear is the belief that there is something you have to do and you don't know what that thing is. So if I told you that an asteroid, mm -hmm. an asteroid is going to hit in a year, you would all of a sudden move into like, oh my gosh, do I have to go, you know, move into one of those, like that crazy silo and, you know, in the desert and try to, you know, to preserve things and do, you know, you, you step into action mode. And fear is this, the, the state of feeling like there's something I need to do and I don't know what it is. And so you, you spin, you spin, you spin into this cycle of anxiety. And so that's where the allowing comes in is when you say, there's nothing I have to do, that all I have to do is be. And the moment you move into do, then you start moving into fear because there is no way you can anticipate what is coming. You cannot, whatever you fear it's like, it's never the thing that bites you. <laughs> Whatever you fear, it's never the thing you end up having to deal with. You cannot anticipate. Otherwise, life would be so boring if you knew everything, right? You can't anticipate it. So all of your preparation, all of your worry is for nothing. It's just, it just wrecks your experience of the now. So the big thing is to recognize when you start to experience fear, it's because you believe there's something you're supposed to be doing and you don't know what it is. And to release that and say, nope. There's nothing I can do. I am going to just, what they want us to do is invest in your life now as though everything's going to be all right because your energy will pull you through. They want you to be, you are creative. Your mm. gaze, your attention is creative. So if you're stuck in fear, that energy is focused internally, trying to find safety and you're desperately searching, trying to figure out what to do. And so you spin and spin and you create a bunch of unnecessary stuff. Instead, if you focus on what it is you want to create and you invest in that and you invest in your life as if it is going to continue on in a beautiful way, that is the energy that's going to pull you through whatever crisis comes your way. And it might turn out differently than you expect, right? But it's the energy that moves on. It will transform into something you didn't anticipate and might be way, way cooler than you originally intended. I mean, that's so interesting because so many things that are coming in too are like how so many structures are going to change, so much is going to shift, yeah. which I know puts a lot of fear in people because you automatically go to doomsday, which it doesn't yeah. always have to be because we don't know what it looks like, right. um, but we automatically go to doomsday. Um, yeah. So it's interesting from that message, it feels more like, no, 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 don't, don't, don't project to that point, put mm -hmm. your energy, like you said, as if everything's going to be okay right. and watch how it unfolds. Exactly. Like you may fear, like the angels, the people who, who listen to a lot of the messages I've shared, there are in and among those messages, some heavy ones about stuff that's coming. And they've been very specific. And a lot of the stuff they said have already come true. They've, they talked very specifically about, about some of these, including bank failures and including supply chain problems and all this stuff way before they happened. So in some of their stuff, it can, people can hear that and they can feel fear sometimes. And that's certainly not the intention. The intention is to make us aware so that if, and when these things happen, we aren't, we aren't caught flat footed. So you may look at that and say, okay, there's all this stuff on the horizon. That means I should just stop what I'm doing and just start stocking up on beans and rice. And that's not the idea. The idea is to, to stay in a state of, of harmony internally, to try to hold that balance yes. 
and to then invest in your life as if, because we don't know how it's going to transform. The one thing that will stay the same is your energy and what you're projecting. And so it will take whatever comes your way and it will turn it into what you need. And it will look different, most likely. But it, but it is, that's the biggest thing you can do is to continue to create. So even if you think things are going to be different, you know, keep working on that book, keep working on that relationship, keep investing in your children, keep saving for college, for your kids, like do all the things as if things will be the same, knowing that they might not and allow and understand that this is just an energy. You investing in your kid's college fund is an energy and money is just energy. And you are, you are putting money, money towards the future of your children. And so even if that money disappears, the energy is still there. The focus, your focus is the thing that creates. So you are in the habit of directing energy towards the future of your children. And that'll continue even if the world changes dramatically. I mean, it's so interesting because ultimately, again, if the whole point is for us to really be kind of creating a different vibration through ourselves, right? And that's really what's being called upon. And that vibration does not include fear <laughs> for what, right. we're, what we're, you know, being asked to do. It is really interesting with some of that information that is probably for those who are like willing to help all of a sudden, yeah. they're almost backtracked into a fear-based place. Um, which again, I noticed a lot in the last few years because, yeah. you know, even those people who it seemed like they had the best intentions, but were operating for such a deep fear state, you're yeah. like, it's just as bad as that thing you're perceiving as awful, you know? 100%. So it's like two, it's the two energies were similar, just again, on the different sides. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's just really fascinating, but it is, it's like, how can we all learn to be steady amongst the chaos? Right. And yes. Yeah. And what do they talk about as far as speed, like depending on what we as in this human incarnation choose to do, how much does that affect speed or severity or of, of what of, transpires of, of what's transpires i mean i think if we were magically able to find that button we were talking about in everybody's head and remove all yep. the judgment then it would be like awesome we're done we don't have to have any of this stuff happen but there is a piece of it that this is about the earth and it is the earth the earth is transitioning to a higher state of frequency and we are the neurons of the earth so we are her thoughts and we have a lot of negative thoughts and just yeah. like we can't shift our own vibration without eliminating a lot of negative thoughts a lot of those negative thoughts have to change they have to shift one way or another so can we affect it the more yeah the more that we and that's part of the reason for the pre-team right the, the pre-team and the post-team the pre-team is here to try to heal as much as we can and that is it, as I would say, what can we do? We can self-heal. We can work on ourselves. And the more that we heal, and healing is just about getting stuff out of your frequency where that are limitations, that it is just, it's like you are trying to radiate light and every one of those is like a little patch on you that prevents some light from shining through. And the more that we can release, the brighter we are, the more light we hold, the better it is for all of humanity. So the, the biggest thing we can do to contribute is self-heal. And then the second biggest thing we can do is to, to shine that light of accepting love to others, right? Is to make space for them to feel that. And you may go out in the world and be all bright and shiny and radiating lots of love and people may totally react to you and, and be angry at you for being so loving. And that <laughs> happens because <laughs> mm -hmm. it's triggering for people. And it's just important to recognize like that's, that's where they are right now. That's their journey. And they may walk away from that experience with you and find transformation in it. And you might never even be aware of it. I mean, that's so beautiful. Can, and I love that. And again, it's a good reminder, just everything we do has a gigantic effect. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit, and then I know I'm, I'm keeping you for a while, but can you talk a little bit about, because you were saying how humans are the neurons of earth. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that relationship between the human body energetically also with the energetic grid and also the energy of the planet and how, what the symbiosis is and actually like how they work together. Yeah. This is so interesting. This actually came up in my, the retreat I had last weekend. Uh, they angels uh, spoke and gave us an experience of the earth. They brought us, it was amazing. Oh, oh my gosh. It was amazing. They, and it's nothing. The earth is nothing like what I thought. It was mind blowing that I've always, I think just being humans, we always personify the earth. We think of her as a she and as feminine and, and having a voice and you'd be able to talk to her and stuff like that. 
and that's not the case. Yes, <laughs> like it's female. It the, yeah, the earth is female. It's, it's a female energy, a feminine energy, I should say. But uh, the thing that was so shocking to me is that the earth uh, doesn't, because like we put everything into the context of humans with mouths and eyes and senses and things like that. And the earth doesn't have a mouth, doesn't have eyes. It's not built like that. The way the earth has a conversation is through digestion is by drawing and and it was this idea that that it understands us by what it absorbs from us so it 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 takes us into itself and pulls us apart the same way like a child like a, a curious kid might take apart a radio to understand how it works it's like that so we are built of the earth like we are all the minerals and all the things that are in the earth the carbon and all this kind of stuff and when when we get reabsorbed into the earth the earth experiences us by taking us apart again and this is how we communicate from with the earth. But the amazing thing is, is when we get digested by the earth, our soul is not in the body. So what she's receiving is all of the information that's stored. The DNA is there, right? It's holding all the information of everything we've experienced, but we're not consciously there. So it was amazing in this experience where they brought us, they brought us into an encounter with the earth. And the way they did it, they, the angels took us for into a very deep meditative state and they kind of primed us and created the space where we could do this. But they brought us down into a space of experience and they created what looked like a mirror. And it, But the mirror was alive and they allowed us, they said, okay, just put a finger in. And the finger was digested. And then they allowed us to put the whole hand in and then the hand was digested. And we had the experience and they were kind of easing us into it so we wouldn't freak out and allow our hand to be digested by the earth and to have this conversation on her terms with her words, you know, it was amazing. And then they, oh, so go ahead. No, go no, go ahead. Keep going. And then I'll ask, go ahead. They, they eventually worked us up to the state where we were allowed our whole selves to be digested. And then we became one with her and we were able to experience, and it was this connection to everything. And we went through the experience of being the water and going through the trees and the grass and the wind. And I mean, it was just mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing. Yeah. Is, is this, this digestion, like, yeah. again, putting it on linear terms, which I know nothing yeah. is linear, but for our brains, yeah. is this digestion something that's happening constantly? Yeah. Yeah. It is like, if you, the way she talked about it, or the way they talked about it, it's like, if you look at this, the ground that we walk on, that nothing and nothing is as solid. And we know that, that nothing is as solid as we think it is, that we right. think of it as hard. It's just that it's very dense. We feel it as hard, but it's just dense. But inside of that, even this desk that I'm working at is is full Energy. of living stuff. It's, it's living things that are like this, like the soil, when you look at it, is like tons of little microorganisms that are constantly changing and evolving. And then even as one thing is starting to dissolve, another thing is absorbing it. And it is, it is this constant rotation of stuff. It's like a kaleidoscope that you're turning in and things, one thing be, is, as it's, you know, becoming or, or dissolving, it's, it's being integrated into another thing. And so it is, yeah, it is this idea. It's just such a, it is so different, such a different way of being embodied than what we are as humans. Like our whole, our whole concept, our whole frame of mind is like, we are a mammal. We have mammal things. We, you know, we give birth, <laughs> we do, you know, we eat, we do all this kind of stuff. And the earth has none of that. So it's almost like how you think about an alien. Like you think, well, well how is the alien going to evolve to survive in its environment? The, the, it, it might have a totally different way of communicating. All of that is true about the earth that the earth has a nervous system. It has all these things, but it's not like ours. Yeah. And so, you know, when we're, let's say, letting go of fear, letting go of, you know, healing ourselves. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, sometimes what is said, so I'm curious after this, that sometimes what is said is that, you know, when you let go and you're, you're letting go of the energy, it actually gets sucked into the earth and transmuted. And then she knows yeah. how to change it, to bring it into the winds or the waters or whatever. Is yeah. that what you feel like was confirmed? Yeah, I do. And I, and I, that, that, that's not, that part wasn't necessarily addressed in that experience, but I do know that it, we talked about polarity and everything being polarized and that humans are polo, polarized, that we have a positive charge, we're like a battery, positive charge at the top, negative charge at the bottom, that as we express those negative emotions, we let them down through our negative charge, it grounds into the earth. And, and that is, is great for her. It's great for us. It is like that fertilizer. So it mulch. goes in and right mulch and it, she can then transform it and turn it into new things. So she takes that negative charge and she then 
transforms it. Yeah. But then let's discuss, I'm curious, and I know you're probably like, I got to go. No, I'm neg- good. I'm good. <laughs> the, the neg- when it's negative and not being flown, flowed or whatever, flowing through you to be released. Yeah. So now yeah. it's just negative within the body. That's the stuff that's hurting her. Is there any intimation at all from the angels of like, what the difference is if it's all energy like how when we release it to her is it the mulch that's in impa- like that actually helps things go versus when it's just within us and is like basically the neurons that are hard for her yeah and i think the difference is emotions versus thoughts that our thoughts are things our thoughts mm-hmm. are creative and that if we are the neurons of the earth we are creating a lot of negative thoughts um versus our emotions which are like the language of the universe, right? That those are like foodstuffs. Thoughts are creative. Thoughts are, and and so that's a very different type of a thing. And I think that's what is, needs to shift because it's, it's, she is trying to shift to a higher level of Mm. consciousness. So she needs to, yeah, to release the, and it certainly does she want to, um, like the, the, what has happened on our world in terms of all the war and all the suffering and all the difficulty, like she is trying to move past that as well. And am I correct in saying there was kind of an agreement that she would hold that space for a while? Like, it's almost like she knew or everyone knew, like there was a period of time she had to kind of hold the space of all that negativity, knowing there was going to be wars, knowing it was going to be difficult. But like that time is like transpired, which is why this is all happening now. Am I getting too woo-woo and weird? That's never too woo-woo for me, just so you know. There is no, <laughs> there is no limits to the woo that I accept. But um, but okay, I don't good. know. It's a, yeah, it's a good question. Like, yeah. There's no question. I I don't actually know. I'd have to ask. So I'm not, I'm not sure if she had like what her current, whether she was a willing participant in all the difficulty or if this was just part of her stages of growth. I don't, I really don't know. Yeah. It's a good question. And then, okay, good. Let me know if you ask. And then (laughs) um, if you, and then as she is like ready to step up, which one, and I've asked this question before, but which one kind of affects the other? Is it she as a planet, is it just part of her evolution? It's time, like she's ready to grow and like we have to match it. Like which one affects the other? Which one's coming up first, I guess? Yeah, what the angels have said is that this is her show and that we are taking advantage of it. We're riding on her coattails, but this is predominantly started by her, that this is her time to evolve, to shift and that we are living on her. So if we want to stay, we got to play along. We got to, and if we if we don't, and, and that's a big thing they've said is that we have a choice that not every human has to ascend. And for some people, it's all the choices made at the higher self level. And that some souls will feel like they are better served by staying within a karmic 3D construct, that that within that construct, you are forced to encounter yourself, that it is it is a, a school of the like the most grueling nature, the one where you can't avoid it. And there are some people that are going to say, you know what, I still have a lot of growth that I can do inside of that construct. So they're going to choose to stay in a 3D construct, which means that they cannot reincarnate here. And that, that some of those souls will stay on the earth and t- for the length of their natural lifetime, it's just, they won't be able to come back. And so for the others who at the higher because self the level, will no longer be 3D. Exactly. That they won't be able to pursue what it is, the experience they want to have. And so for those souls, there's another place being created, another 3D experience, another school, another earth school, basically, where they will get to go. And they will be able to continue to stay within their karmic pattern and to have that experience for as long as they want to have it so that they can continue to learn and evolve. And then there are other souls who feel like, nope, I'm ready. This is good. I am ready to move into this other state of consciousness. And they will stay on, in this particular ex- experience of earth. Have they yeah. given you a sense of like numbers, like percentages? <laughs> oh, um, you know, they're angels. Oh, they have, but you won't say it. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be, we're headed for some difficult times and it's not easy to talk about. And I've talked about a lot of it. I mean, you know, you've listened to some of my stuff and I've talked about a lot of it and there's difficult times coming. And, um, the one thing that the angels have said is that, is that there is no soul that is going to be left behind, that there's no single soul that will ever be overlooked, that everyone is cared for, that anybody who leaves us during this process is doing so by choice and that that not at the con- not at the conscious human level but at the the higher self level and that it will be of service to them and that they every single one will be will be taken care of um and and so but yeah i do think we will experience loss 
I am sure of it, that we will experience loss. And that's hard. A loss is hard. And what they have said is to not deny the sadness, like to recognize that it's painful, right? To recognize the loss, but also to not, not wish for what was to be willing to be in that state of allowing and to try our best to move into what's coming because we are headed to something amazing for humanity. Like we're trying to get to a place where there isn't the same degree of suffering on this planet. And I think that's something everybody wants. Is, um, and then this kind of has nothing to do with what we we're talking about, but the lost brought it up is have they talked about flurry is not the right word, but you'll understand what I'm saying. This kind of rise in suicide, especially of the younger generation. Oh my gosh. You know what? They haven't talked about it. Is that connected to all of it? It is a great question. I don't know. They haven't talked about that specifically. Like there's, I mean, there's suicide, there's violence, there's, you know, there's all these sort of mass, mass killings that are happening like crazy, like one a day in the U S it used to be, there would be one and it would be on the news for weeks. My daughter called it the poly crisis. Like right. it's just, you know, and the word, you know, uh, uh, unprecedented is like, it's just, everybody's so tired of that word because everything is unprecedented and we are the frogs in the pot. And what I would say mm-hmm. is that, is that, you know, that it's, it's boiling and the temperature is going up and up and, you know, news events that before would have captured people's attention for weeks. Now they're replaced you know, where, and it's, you know, ca- you know, massive catastrophic, you know, catastrophic earthquake where, you know, gazillions of people are dead. And two weeks later, two days later, we're talking about something else. And it's yep. just, it is, uh, I think it is the intensity of the energy. It's everything is energy. Every one of those occurrences is an energy and the energies are turning up, turning up, turning up. And it is, it's, we are on a path and it's not an easy path. And it's, it's, it is like to recognize that the thing I always say is that whenever you start to worry or to fear is not only do we recognize fear comes from that state of being where you think there's something you're supposed to do and you don't know what it is. But the place I like to come back to is to draw your awareness back to your four walls, to wherever you are right now and to stop moving it out into the world and looking for where all the difficulty is to move it back to where you are right in that moment to look around you and to recognize you're okay. And that, and that what they show is that if you can stay in that space of loving acceptance, you will be fine. Like to move your awareness back, to call it back in and to recognize that everything that's around you right now, de facto, because of the fact that you are listening to this, it means that you have access to resources. You have access to power. It means you are okay in whatever way, maybe not perfect, but okay. And so mm. that's where we need to bring our awareness back to. And they've said repeatedly, that yes, there are a ton. They've talked about a lot of very difficult things. But the other thing they say is that not everything happens everywhere. There will be this happening there, this happening. It's like they talked about, they said early, the truck drivers will abandon their routes. I didn't understand what the heck they were talking about. I couldn't imagine why they would do that. And then we have, you know, we have a situation that happened in Canada and we have the situations that happened at, you know, at the freight terminals here in the U.S. where it was like the truck drivers, but there was not enough truck drivers. And in the U.K., they were down 100,000 truck drivers because of Brexit. They didn't have any, any, so they, they didn't have any shipments. And then, you know, and it just, and in Australia, there was going to be a truck driver strike. So it was like an energy that popped up here and here and here, but it wasn't everywhere. It was an energy that expressed in different places. So they said, as you look at all this stuff, not everything happens everywhere. And they said, it won't, it won't be that there will be nothing available. It just means that there won't be everything available. So it's to be aware that, that you can't prepare. You can't get yourself in a place where you're going to be able to keep life exactly as it is. And that's okay because we want to make space for change. We want to clear out the closet and invite in something much better. And ultimately life is never the same anyway. Like even without yeah, these big so changes, true. it's like, yeah. you can never, I mean, you know, you've been through two divorces, like you cannot guarantee what the next day looks like ever. Right. Right. And that change, sometimes the hardest things are the thing that the then best. transports us to that much higher expression than would have ever been possible otherwise. So I know it's, it seems hard, but it is, um, there is a path through and it, it really is how much can we trust? How much can we allow? to recognize, to be aware of your fear, to honor your feelings, and to realize there's, there's nothing that you need to do right now other than work on yourself, that you are the most important thing. Well, on that note, that's a perfect place to wrap up before we hear your personal practice. But I want to say thank you so much for so much 
so much great information and tangible solutions and things we should all be paying attention to for ourselves. But I mean, it, again, at the core, what you said is self-healing, self-healing, self-healing. So yeah. let's all just yeah. do our best to like really, you know, work on ourselves. A hundred percent. And to know that when you do that, you are helping humanity. That it's not, it's not only does it improve your life and creates a more friction-free experience of your life, but it helps everyone because you are shifting the collective. Yeah. hundred percent. It's like buy one, get the second one free. <laughs> it is. Which, yeah, that's exactly It's a two for one sale. The best kind of two for one. Yes. This yeah. was a delight. I so appreciate you. Thank you so much. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.